Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. So welcome to the civil engineering training. Today, we're going to talk about the civil engineering aspects um, in an overview. We're going to look at the structures that we are building in Innovation Africa. We're going to talk about the job of the civil engineer in Innovation Africa, what, what the civil engineer uh, do during our projects and what their responsibilities. And uh, at last, we're going to talk about the construction stages for our projects. I want to mention that this, uh, this lecture is going to give us an overview and a general concept about the civil engineering in Innovation Africa. And during the week, we're going to have more detailed uh, lessons about the aspects of the civil engineering. So whoever wants and able, you're welcome to see the, the in-depth training that we're going to have this week. So first we're going to see our civil engineering team. So in Israel, this is me and Shalom Mor. We have Josian and Daniel from Cameroon. We have Harry and Jafet in Zambia. William and Rachel from Uganda team and Chisomo and Raymond from Malawi team. Rogers, he is also the country uh, manager in Uganda. And we have Archard Wangisa from Tanzania. So there is one country we didn't mention is South Africa. So in South Africa, we don't have civil engineers yet. Uh, although some of the people do uh, site supervision for civil engineering, but I hope that in the future we will be able to present uh, the civil engineers of South Africa. And other than our team, we also uh, work with third party supervision or third party designers. So in each country, we have different uh, uh, consultants that we work with. And in the next slide, we're going to explain their role. So we have Axola in Tanzania. We have uh, Niv or Ivan in Uganda, Brian Chuto in Zambia, William and Justina from Insight Company in Malawi. We have Conrad in, from Tirisano Company in South Africa, and our designer, Jean Jules from Cameroon. So where the construction works or where the civil engineering part comes into place in the whole thing that called water project in Innovation Africa. So as, as you saw previously by Emily and Gil, uh, they, they talked about the drilling and the pumping tests and the part that we are actually looking for water. So first of all, we have the prospective, then we have the well drilling and pump testing. And based on this information, the water department is doing the water design, as you know, the Epanet design. And after the water design, the construction works are coming into place. So we decide what to build and the quantities of the structures according to the water design. We will talk about it in detail later. And of course, when the construction works are over, we are uh, going into the completion and handover of the project. So what we are building in Innovation Africa. So we have our water towers. We have a 10 meter water tower and a seven meter water tower as you see in the pictures. The height of the tower is defined by the water department and it's a derivative of the water design. If we need a higher uh, elevation to gain more uh, uh, water pressure, so we build a higher tower and so on. We also have three meter tank stands. 
we are building cattle troughs in some countries. In some countries, we don't have uh, any cattle trough uh, structures. And of course, the tap stands, the tap or, or the water points as they called in other countries where the community uh, are taking their water. Other than that, we also have a valve manhole or a borehole manhole. And this is in general, the structures that we are building as part of uh, our projects. Now we're going to see a quick video of a interview, of an overview, sorry, by uh, Leonard from Tanzania. Um, Moti, we can't hear the video. You need to share, you need to stop. And when you share, you need to share sound from the computer. Today, you are going to see Perfect. step by step the construction of water structures. This construction of water structures the explanation will be based on the Innovation Africa manual. We are going to see the construction of water tower. We are going to see the construction of water reticulation. And finally, the construction water domestic point or water kiosk or water point. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to Tanzania. Asante sana. Welcome to Tanzania. My name is Leonard uh, from Axon. Okay. All right. So um, after we, we actually decide what we're going to build, the quantity of, of the tap stands, the number of tap stands, if we're going to have a cattle trough, uh, what kind of tower we're going to build, to build. So then we have the second thing that is called the bill of quantities or in short, the BOQ. So the bill of quantity is actually the document that summarizes the quantities of the items and the materials that we are going to use in a specific project. So the civil engineer in each country is actually part of the civil engineering section of the BOQ. So uh, some of the quantities should be adjusted according to the number of items or the number of structures that we are building in a specific project. So let me show you an example. So if I will open uh, the bill of quantity of Uganda, um, Mati, we don't see it because we're just sharing this one sure, slide. Sure, sure. I will open it first and then I will share it. No problem. No problem. All right. Oh. Yeah. Also, quickly, just for you to know that the person you're seeing at those videos, his name is Leonard, and he is our contractor in Tanzania. In Tanzania, we only have one contractor. His name is Leonard, and he, uh, for uh, four to five weeks, spent time with our videographer, and together they created those short videos for you. So uh, in the next two hours, you're going to see many videos from the different st um, stages of the construction. And uh, please don't worry, we're going to send you all the videos uh, by the end of today. So those videos, you can also share them with your contractors. So it can also follow those different steps. All right, so um, what we're seeing now is an example of, of BOQ template of Uganda. So we have the tabs below and each tab is referring to other part of the BOQ. And if we go, for example, for BOQ of 10 meter civil works, we will have, we will see 
all kinds of items refer referring to the civil works of a 10 meter tower. So we have the, um, the quantities of the concrete according to the structural elements and we having the quantities of reinforcement steel and so on. And also we, we have the uh, auxiliary structures. The auxiliary structures are the tap stand and the cattle trough and all the other manholes that we are building. So this part, for example, should be adjusted per project. So we have a specific number of tap stands for each project and the soak pits and the numbers and the quantities are defined for every project. So I'm going back to the, to the presentation. Okay. So the bill of quantities is basically, be, be, it's based on the drawings, on the design. So each country had their own drawings and the, the own their own design. Basically, the designs are very similar because we are building the same structures, but in every country, there are some modifications based on the foundation system, or other things that are specific to the country. So another important thing to understand is that the bill of quantity always goes hand to hand with the drawings, right? The drawings are the, the actual instructions of what to build and how to build it. This is how the contractors and the, the builders are actually, this is how they know what to build. And the quantities shown on the drawings must comply and be uh, correct with the BOQ. So it's very important to read the BOQ together with the drawings. We're going to discuss it in uh, detail later on this week, and we will have an exercise together with the civil engineers of how to calculate quantities and how to understand each and every item in the BOQ and how it connects to the uh, design set, to the drawings. So the role of the civil engineer basically is to ensure that the contractors receive and has on site a hard copy of the drawings. So based on some experience, sometimes we saw that the contractors maybe they don't have the drawings on site or maybe they have uh, old drawings and not updated drawings. And this is like uh, doing a, a, a recipe with the wrong, uh, you know, with the wrong instructions. So the civil engineer, when you go to the site, ask the contractors, where are the drawing set and have a look to see if they have the most updated drawings. And you can see it in the side of each drawing or at the bottom where the revision and the date is being uh, noted. The design drawing package for each country uh, can be found here through the links or in our uh, Google Drive. So you go into the link or and it, it links you to the Google Drive. And for each country, you will see a folder of the BOQ templates and the uh, design drawing set. So this is the place, the only place where you can get the latest revision of drawings and BOQ. This is a very important point because when we talk about design drawings and BOQ, this is very important to note and to see if we use the latest revision and what we are sharing with the contractors. Because if we're going to share the wrong BOQ or the wrong drawings, and then we're going to find it later when the project is already started, we will have some uh, adjustments to made or some uh, you know, quantity difference between 
the contractor, what he's, he was preparing to the, to the project and what he actually has on site. So it's very important to be ready with the most updated drawings and the correct BOQ prior to the beginning of the construction. So, what you are seeing now, Yeah, let me continue. Another thing that the civil engineer need to, to be aware of is of course the work schedule. So as you know, for every project, we have a predefined uh, working schedule when the construction begins and when it should end. So contractors, they create a work schedule for the project. In the work schedule, you can see that they detail the activities and the stages of constructions that they are going to do on the same period, on the exact period of time that they are describing in the work schedule. For example, in this slide, we can see that in Biwi Water Project, from 21st of November to the 27th of November, so it's one week. The, the contractor is describing uh, what kind of elements he's going to cast and, and other activities in the construction. Now, the civil engineer from IA needs to be aware of this working schedule because we, of course, we want to know if the contractors are working on schedule, if they're on time, if they're delaying the works, if they are maybe going even faster. And this is very important to be aware of and to regu regularly check what we see on site, what we see actually uh, the, the activities on site uh, together with the working schedule. The other thing with working schedule is to be able to foresee any challenges before they come to us. So if you know that next week, for example, the contractor should, for example, cast the first slab or, uh, or, or columns. So you can already ask him if he's ready with all the materials, with all the preparations he should do for the upcoming activity. And then he can tell you if he has any challenges or he need any, any help or if everything is okay. So this is another tool for us to understand uh, the ongoing activities and schedule of the project. So another, another step on going to, to the site, the civil engineer need to make sure that 10 trainees have been selected from the village. And these 10 trainees are going to participate in the construction of the project. So as you know, we, we, we have the community involved in the construction and 10 trainees are being trained to do civil works. So we need to make sure that the contractor actually use, use those 10 trainees and, and uh, uh, teaching them the, the right skills to help him with the construction. You can see in the picture, they are all dressed up with the PPE equipment with all the right clothes and the helmets, and we're going to discuss it further. So we have another video for the trainees. After introducing that we are going to set a project, we request 10 trainees from the, within the villages such that we will be together during our implementation of the project. Uh, those 10 trainees are selected during the village uh, meeting. Why we select those 10 uh, trainees? First of all, we need those uh, 10 trainees as an ambassador of the village to witness what we are constructing here in their villages. And uh, also from those trainees is where we get uh, three options. First of all, we get option of plumbers. Those who are going to repair the system, they are going the whole time to learn how we fix the pipes in the streets. Also, we get uh, uh, three guys for masonry. 
to see how we mix lashes for cement or concrete is. And also we get three others for steel fixing to learn how we fix our reinforcement in our structures. And then lastly, we get two guys who are going to help us in the street to strain lines for trench gigging. So in so doing, it means that uh, the village will enhance the, this project after completion. Those ambassadors will get knowledge or know how the project has been started, constructed and completion. And also during their meeting, village meeting, some question will arise from the, the civilians. So they will be responsible to witness how the project has been completed and uh, what steps. And if it happen anything to repair, because they will be well equipped, knowledgeable, themselves they are going to repair the project. In so doing, it means that we expect our project will be sustainable. Thanks for listening. After introducing that we are going to start a project, we... Okay, so we saw the wonderful video about the trainees. And second thing we need to make sure is the PPE equipment. So we need to, to see that all the workers use PPE. This is the protective equipment, the helmet, uh, the gloves, the proper uh, boots, and the clothes, of course, the overalls that protect the workers during the construction, uh, construction works. So let's see another video about the safety gear. I wanna go back to the... Before we start construction, let us talk about safety gear. In construction, safety gear is very important. And those soft gears start from foot or leg up to the head. For instance, on the leg, you should have to wear a tough boot like this one. This tough boot should be well protected such that a nails or any steel cannot penetrate and harm the leg of the workers. Also, uh, the workers should be well protected with a good uniform so the body of the workers should be well uh, protected with overloads. Yeah, if you come to the eyes, because the eyes, eyes are very sensitive and we should have to protect it, you should have to wear a glass or goggles. This goggles helps to protect the eyes from any splashes, splashes of concrete, splashes of dust, splashes of nails, splashes of pieces of binding wire. So the workers should be well aware, covered his face, such that anything where city jump come to his is well protected. Also, the workers should be well protected with his hands because these hands touch uh, steel bars, touch aggregate, touch reinforcement, bind. So you should have to protect his hands, his fingers, such that it cannot be cut down and uh, harm the workers. Once he become harm, it means that the efficient of the work reduces. Also, on top of the head, he should have to be to wear a helmet, a hard helmet like this one. This one helps a lot to the workers during working, during uh, concreting, during shuttling. A nail or a piece of seed can fall down and harm the workers. So we should have to protect our workers to make sure that they wear a hard helmet to make them survive, to make them safe. Yeah, so uh, in short, soft gear to the workers is very important as it has well stipulated in Innovation Africa manual. So we should have to follow or to comply with Innovation Africa manual. Thank you very much for listening to me. All right, thank you, Leonard. And... One second, please. Yeah. 
One second, back to. Meanwhile, please don't hesitate to send your questions. And at the end, uh, Moti and Shalom will be answering uh, all of them if we have time, and I'm sure we will. So please don't hesitate. Any question, uh, even the most basic one, please, that's the time to do so. That's. Uh... Yeah, one second, we need to share the screen. Thank you for Tara already answering some of the questions. Uh, one of the questions from Roger was about, can we pay our, the contractors uh, to buy everything for the PPE? Yes, it is part of the BOQ and we are. Uh, it is part of the budget. We are paying for those uh, PPE. So yes, it is part of the money that we are paying to the contractors so he can buy uh, whatever is necessary for his team members and for the 10 trainees. Okay. You Before we over. start. All right. So um, after, after the BOQ and the drawings, we're going into the site supervision itself. So once the construction works uh, starts, we're going to do, of course, the civil engineer is doing the site supervision. So uh, we need to make sure that all of the materials are on site and see the, the condition of the storage of the, the construction materials. So first of all, we're going to discuss, um, do you see this one? This thing. Yeah, we're going to discuss the concrete components. So the concrete is, is made of sand, aggregates, cement, and water, right? So all these uh, components are being mixed to create the concrete. And yeah. All right. So the storage of materials on site is very important. So you can see that the cement bags are stored away in a place where they are sheltered from rain and moisture because the cement can be damaged or uh, they, it can react with moisture and water. And we don't want it to happen before we do the actual concrete batching. And uh, the, the aggregate should be stored in a way that they will not mix with the ground because we want to keep them clean and pure as possible. The reinforcement still should be well organized and elevated from the ground. And all the shattering uh, materials should be also well organized and clean, clean out from rust or from any oils to make sure that the casting will, uh, will be good. Other materials that we have on site is the shuttering for slabs. So we have wood, wood shuttering uh, or, or foam works, also called foam works. And we will see also the scaffolding and the props. As you see here, we will uh, talk about it later. We have the contractor has also an, the equipment for construction. So the concrete mixer, and the poker vibrator and the soil compactor should be on site. And also we will talk each and every uh, item, the importance of each and every one item and how do we use it in the construction. So the civil engineer responsibilities for site supervision, this is a very important uh, slide to to summarize the overall responsibility. So the responsibility is to perform the site supervision from the beginning from, of the construction until the completion. Then to document and report every site supervision and visit 
and, and the progress of the construction. So it is very important to understand that if you go to the site and you have observations and you maybe you discuss with the contractor and, and give, him, give him any remarks and so on, if you don't document and you don't report, it, it is as it was not existing, like it never happened. So it's very important that whenever you go to a site supervision, you will document and report all your findings. So we're going to have the Innovation uh, Africa, the Inno app, and you're going to have a site supervision form. So we will be able to, yeah, 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 I see some happy people and I'm also happy that we're going to have this tool developed by our software engineer and Tara and a lot of people helped in this process. So you're going to have the form on your phone and you will fill in all the questions and, and upload pictures and write your description and then save it on your device. And once you go back to the internet and you have a decent connection, you will upload your report to our database. This way we will have a standard way to report our findings and our site supervision. And it will be much easier for all of us to see this information. We will go, we will go uh, into detail and show these uh, forms later on this week. And another important thing that the civil engineer should do is to have a fluent communication with the contractors for updates and for problem solving. So the contractors, when they start to work, they, they work pretty much every day on site. And our team in each country handles few projects simultaneously. The job of the civil engineer is to be able to update the status of each and every project. We need to know what's happening on our project any moment, what they are doing today and what they are planning to do, okay? Other than just ask the contractor what he is doing, I would really suggest, and I really want our civil engineers also to be on top of the schedule. We were talking about the schedule. So you know what they are doing today, what the activities on a specific site, on a specific day. But, and then you know if they are on schedule, or they are behind schedule. And when you talk and communicate with the contractors, you can also know what they're planning to do on the following week. And if they're going to meet their goals of the schedule, okay? This is another important way to see upfront, to hear about any challenges that the contractors may have. And a lot of times we can help them to solve those challenges and prevent any delays in the project. For example, sometimes the contractors say that the trenching works are going slow because maybe the community is not very, is not engaged or there are some issues with the collaboration of, of the community, for example. So if we will catch this thing earlier and see that the trenching is going slow, so we will be able to help the contractor to engage the community, for example. Or some contractors find uh, challenging, challenges in storing a proper storage for the materials, right? So we can also help, help them to find uh, storage houses within the community and give them a lot of support ahead, ahead of time to prevent any delays. So basically this, this table is uh, detailing all the things that the site supervision of, of civil engineering should, should check. So we have, we have four or five big topics. Materials, this is the materials of the construction. So you need to check the quality of the materials 
and the storage of those materials. And it includes the sand, the aggregate, the cement, the shuttering, the scaffolding, and so on. We have the methods. So the methods are the methods of work, how the, how the contractors are executing uh, the construction. If they're using all the right equipment, like the concrete mixer, the poker vibrator, if they're using scaffolding for, uh, for uh, uh, working at height, for example, how they lift the tank, if they're using pulleys or cranes, okay? Uh, the construction methods also include the batching of the concrete, the, the, the soil compacting and so on. We will go briefly into those stages later. And another third main topic is the design compliance. So as we discussed earlier, we have the, the design drawings and the BOQ that this design is specific for every project, right? We are building a specific number of towers and tap stands and so on uh, per, the, per project. So when we are making site supervision, we need to make sure that the activities on site and the structures that are built on site on the ground are matching the design. Okay, and it can go from the overall checking, of course, the number of taps, the location of the taps, uh, the number of towers and their location, and go into the finest details of the design, which can be the dimensions, the reinforcement uh, dimensions, and so on. We will also talk about it later. And another important topic is the safety. The safety of work we talked earlier and the schedule of work, of course. Okay. So the design compliance, this is what you say. The design compliance is referring to the drawing set. So this is an example of of the blueprints, the drawings of the constructions that I'm sure lots of you already saw. So when we go to the site, it is very, very important and it's a must that our team will have the most updated drawing set with them. Actually, I, I would expect that our civil engineers will know by heart their design of each country. And we will do it on the workshop and in the rest of the week when we will go through the design. I believe that at some point after you will go through the design a few times, all the civil engineers will know their design. They will know the height of the floors, the general amount of reinforcement, the general dimensions of, of the elements. So this is where we're going. This is what we, what we expect from our civil engineers to know, but you also need to have the drawings with you when you go to the site. If you need to discuss anything with the contractor, you can open the relevant drawing and show them the specific element and discuss it. This, is, this will also help you to make sure that what you see is according to the design. For example, what we see here is uh, reinforcement detail of a slab. And also the dimensions of the slabs are noted here. So if I'm going to the site now and making a site supervision, just before casting, seeing the foam works and the reinforcement fixing before casting, the civil engineer should have a tape measure to check the dimensions of the foam works to see if they comply with the design, okay? So we were talking about the, the reinforcement. So the reinforcement steel is the steel bars that we put into structural elements. And then we cast the concrete into the steel to, to have reinforced concrete. 
the fixing of the reinforcement and the amount of the reinforcement is defined by the bending schedule. The bending schedule is part of the design set. All the drawings of each country contain the bending schedule and it has a, a, a standard uh, shape codes. You see the SC here column, the column of SC is a shape code. Each, each and every number of shape code actually resemble the shape of the reinforcement and the length and the quantity and the diameter of the reinforcement. The civil engineer need to know to be aware of the bending schedule of his country or hers, to know what type of diameters we are using. If, if in my bending schedule, I only use diameters between eight and 16, and then I'm, I'm going to the site and suddenly I see smaller diameters or something that is off that I never saw before, that should raise the flag and, and, and gives me the, the hint to go and check in detail what is happening with the reinforcement. So when you will go on site, you will see the trainees or the workers of the contractor preparing the, the, the steel works, the reinforcement uh, works according to the bending schedule. They need to cut the steel and bend it with special tools. So sometimes you can see this type of, of bending uh, tool. It is efficient, but it, it might cause some uh, uh, wrong, wrong bending because it's not sitting on the same plane. And the best way to do it is to have a bending uh, device, which is fixed on a table. It's an, actually, it's a bending table, okay? And when they have it on site, they, are, they will be able to, to do the reinforcement fixing much quicker and in efficient way. And Shalom was preparing uh, a video to explain this, this uh, thing in detail and we will show it in the next uh, lectures. Okay, so we discussed drawings and BOQs. So other than the drawing and the BOQ, we have one more thing that, that is related to the design and to the instructions of how to build the project. This is the construction manual, okay? So the construction manual is a document that I'm sure a lot of you already saw. So I want to announce and say that we have a new updated construction manual and it's standard for all the countries. The construction manual describes the instructions and the standards of IA of how to build specific elements, how to batch concrete, what are the the correct amounts and all the specification and details that required to construction. So I highly encourage our civil engineers to, to be updated on the new construction manual and read it and see if they understand everything. And of course, if you have any questions or remarks, we will discuss it in our further uh, lectures. Okay, so until now we discussed the, the civil engineering in general, and now we're going into the construction stages. So, this one, okay. So for a water tower, we have uh, 10, 10 stages, 10 main stages of construction. When we build a tower, we start from the ground up to the sky, okay? This is the logical way of building a tower. We start from the ground towards up. So we start from the foundations. You can see the foundations here. The foundations are the elements that comes into contact with the ground and take all the loads 
and, and, and the stresses from the tower and transfer it to the ground. We have the ground slab and the apron. We have the first columns, the pump room with the block works. We have the first slab, uh, second columns, the tank slab, which is also known as load bearing slab, because this slab holds the load of the tank full, that, that, that is full with water, yeah? 10 tons, it weighs 10 tons. So this is also known as load bearing slab. We have the third columns, the top slab, and at last we have the mounting structure, the mounting structure for the solar panels. Those are the construction stages that we refer to the civil engineering works. So once uh, the, all the stages are completed, of course, uh, we have the completion and, and approval at the end for handover. So other than the towers, we, we also have the auxiliary structures. One of them is the tap stand, the water point. So when we do the tap stand, of course, we are checking the location and the marking of the, of the tap because each tap is designed according to the Epanet design. And the location of the tap is critical to make sure that the water flow and the water pressure will be as according to design. So we check the location and then we, we see we, they have the foundation. It's basically the lower slab that it's embedded into the ground and, be, and just about below uh, ground level. Then we have the shuttering works and the casting of the concrete together with the reinforcement, the soak away pit, and the valve manhole. So the next thing we have is the cattle trough. Same, very similar to the tap stand. The location of the cattle trough is very important also because of the water pressure and the sanitary issues. Sometimes, most of the times, the cattle troughs are being a little bit far away from the village or in the outskirts of the village because uh, all the cattle uh, is, 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 uh, is gathering here and the sanitary uh, conditions needs to to make sure that the cattle trough is far away from our water source. And from, for the construction, it's the, the stages are very similar. We have the location, the foundations, the casting of the concrete and the block works, and the soak away pit and the valve manhole. Another stage that is also part of construction and the water works uh, is the trenching and the pipe laying. And I'm sure that this issue will also be discussed with the water department, but uh, of course the trenching is a major part of the construction to connect all of the structures to the same uh, system of pipeline. So uh, when we do a site supervision, we need to see that the trenches, the trench path is correct, the excavations, are correct according to the depth and the width of the, of the design. Once they are, lay, they are laying the pipe, we need to make sure that the pipe diameter is correct. And after the approval of IA representative, that the diameters are correct and the path is correct, the, con the contractor may uh, cover the trenches. So in the construction stages, we have what's called a critical stage of construction. It is also known as a stopping point due to the significance of the concrete casting. So if you think about it, uh, when, you, when you cast an element, 
and the concrete is hardened, the only way, most of the time, the only way to fix this element is to break it. So in major steps of, of concrete casting in construction, we have a stopping point, a critical stage where we stop just before casting the concrete to make sure that everything is in order. So in our projects, we have three critical stages. This is the ground slab stage, the tank slab stage, and the final stage of completion and snags. I know that in some cases, we, we have other stages that we closely supervise, but this is specific for each, uh, each contractor. But those critical stages are the three stages, the ground slab, the tank slab, and the completion. So in those critical stage, we need the approval of our third party consultants. They are also the designers of the structure and they have a legal responsibility for the safety and stability of the structure. And they need to make sure that those critical stages are performed accordingly. So you see here on the side, we, all, we already discussed who are those consultants for every country. And before those critical stages, we seek the approval for forecasting. We will, we will see examples uh, in the next slides. Okay, so the first construction stage is the foundations, setting out and foundations. So once we decided where the, where the tower is going to be, the setting out stage is the stage of, uh, of, of choosing, of, of checking the location of the tower and the locations of the foundations. And of course, construction, con constructing the foundations. So we have two major uh, types of foundations in Innovation Africa. So in Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, and Cameroon, we are doing pad foundations. And in Tanzania and South Africa, we are doing beam foundation. The difference is due to the type of soil and the local uh, common practices. So now we can see another video of foundation. Let's... Today is the first day of setting out our structure. We are going to set here to excavate a foundation such that our structure will be erected at this point. We are going to measure from that borehole to 1.5 and then is where we are going to erect our structure. Our borehole always stay out, uh, out of the pump house. So the pump house is going to be erected here. So uh, before starting setting out, you should have to have uh, some important tools which helps for setting out. The first one, you should have to have a lop. This is the lop which you are going to use it for setting out here to make sure, to make sure that we straight a line which will be excavated for our structure. Also, this is a measuring tape such that will be used here to measure our dimension of our structure. Yeah, and then here, you see, we have a digging mattock. This is a digging mattock, which will help us to dig the ground, to excavate here, to make sure that we come up to the uh, required foundation. Also, uh, we have this uh, peg. This peg, as we are environmental friendly, we have changed from using timber to the steel. So this will be used to mark the points where uh, we are going to ex excavate our foundation. Yeah, and this one, this is, we call it a set square. This is a square. Will help us to make sure that our angles of our setting lobe will be to the 90 degrees. Also, uh, we have this hacksaw. This one will help us to cut this steel, steel pose 
to make sure that we get the size which we need. And uh, also we have here such that we are going to tie here uh, are those which I have already explained. So here now, yeah, this again, is the you see that we have completed the setting out. Everything we have After marked. After the setting out lobe, positions uh, And we have demarcated where the trench for the uh, correct location will be. So in order to let those who markings. are going to dig, we put white mark. <coughs> this white mark can be a lamb powder or anything which can uh, identify the boundary of digging such that anybody who is digging will be guided with this powder. Yeah. So in short, uh, is how we set out and start our structure digging foundation. Thank you very much for listening. So after setting out, the following uh, steps was to excavate. So now you see that our, our foundation has gone two meters deep. The next step is uh, to compact at the bottom uh, to make the soils uh, more closer or dense. And then after compacting, we see compacting machines, then we are going to concrete for blinding layer along this strip foundation. After concreting that a layer of uh, blinding, then the next step will be a shuttering. We are going to, sh to, 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 to make a shuttering according to the size of our beam. After making that shuttering, we are going to fix steels, which is already bent or already uh, prepared. We are going to fix inside and then as well in the corner we are going to fix a, a starters and then after that installation you will see the whole pictures how we start from foundation coming up now the reinforcement and box is laid the next step is pouring concrete in the foundation during that pouring concrete we should have to take a sample this is a sampling box this concrete will be sent to the laboratory in order to get uh, uh, the strengths of mix of concrete which we have used in the foundation. This is one, but we have other three, such that all cubes will be taken to the bottom. During pouring concrete in the foundation, we should have the things like this one. This we call a uh, poker or vi vibrating machine for compacting concrete while we were pouring in the foundation. This will be vibrating, in so doing, the airs will be uh, releasing from the concrete. In so doing means the concrete will be coming denser, 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 and heavy and tight, so our structure and our foundation will be strong enough. Thank you very much for listening to me. Asante. Today is a... All right, so we saw the foundation video. And as we, as we mentioned before, we have uh, different types of foundation for every country. So what we saw is the foundations uh, from Tanzania, the beam foundation. But the same principles are correct also for other countries with the path foundations. So after the foundations were being constructed, the second, the second uh, construction stage is the ground slab. So the ground slab is, is, uh, perform, is, is acting as the floor of the pump room and the floor of the tower. And we also have the apron, which is part of the ground slab that helps us to drain away rains and water from the surrounding of the building. And the ground slab, as mentioned before, is a critical stage. Critical stage should be uh, uh, approved and supervised by the consultant. So this picture describes how it should look like before the third party supervision is coming to the site. So our civil engineers, our team need to make sure that this stage is ready for the supervision of the third party consultant. We can see here that the shuttering, the foam works are installed, the damp proof membrane is installed, the starter bars are erected from the foundations and the reinforcement 
of the ground slab is ready with the spacers and, and, and everything. What we are not seeing in this picture is the grounding system. The grounding system is also part of the ground slab and we will see it in the next slide. So when the consultant comes to the site, he needs to see that all the arrangements and everything is in order. And then the consultant gives the approval for casting. And then the, the contractor casting concrete into the formworks. And it looks like that. This, in this picture, we see the worker uh, working to, to level the, the concrete. As mentioned before, the earthing system uh, is also part of the ground slab. So the earthing system in general, this is part of the uh, electrical, uh, electrical uh, preparations that we do for our towers. So we have the solar panels that brings the electricity for the, the, the pump and other uh, electrical appliances that we have, maybe the monitoring system and so on. So we need to make sure that we have a proper grounding or earthing system. And what we're doing, we are doing a foundation grounding. We are taking any excess voltage and run it through the foundations of the structure to the ground. So the preparations of the grounding system is part of the reinforcement fixings of the ground slab. This is another reason why this uh, construction stage, the ground slab, is a critical stage. So our civil engineers need to make sure that in this site supervision of the third party consultant, other than the shuttering and the reinforcement and other things, we need to make sure that the grounding system is also properly installed. Of course, that the details for the grounding system is uh, shown on the drawings in the design set and in the construction manual. So if you have any questions or any doubts about the uh, earthing system, you can also advise uh, us, me or Shalom or other team members from Innovation Africa. But it's very important to make sure that this is installed before casting, because after casting, it will be harder to fix it. Okay, so after the ground slab is, is completed, we are building our first columns to, to go uh, higher with the tower. So this is how we build the, the columns. We have uh, special shattering, steel shattering, for, for the columns, those steel shutterings are reusable. So during the site supervision, we need to make sure that the settings and the installation of the shuttering is correct. The dimensions of the columns are according to the design. We need to see that they're using spacers. You see those black circles hanging on the reinforcement those are spacers. These spacers make sure that there, there is enough room between the surface of the shuttering to the reinforcement. This is called the uh, concrete cover. So we will have the right cover for the reinforcement because when we see a column or we see a ground after it's casted and completed, we're not seeing the reinforcement, right? The reinforcement is hidden in between, in, inside the concrete and the concrete cover is a design, it's, it's a design thickness uh, according to the chemical environment of the concrete and the level of protection we want to provide for the reinforcement. So we need to make sure that the shuttering for the columns are vertical, okay? Not tilting. We need to see the dimensions of the columns are correct. We have the, the spacers for the cover and the reinforcement fixing is also according to the design. Here we can see the stirrups, the rings for the columns. So I would ask 
if those rings are in the correct spacing. So we need to see if, if the rings are in the correct spacing, if the diameters of the steel bars are correct. Another important thing for columns is once the contractor is starting to cast the concrete, you need to make sure that they are using the poker vibrator. Because try to imagine that you have, uh, you have a closed shuttering for a narrow and long element and you pour inside concrete, a wet concrete, fresh concrete with stones and sand. This thing can, can easily uh, be casted with voids or with air trapped inside the shuttering. So using the poker vibrator is very important to make sure that the casting of the concrete is continuous throughout the column. Let's see another video by Leonard for columns. Today we are going to cut this uh, underground columns. This underground column is identical to all the columns of our towers. It is 25 centimeter, both sides, lengths and widths. But the height of it differs. We have three types of columns, or which differ in length. In the underground, it is 1.5, 1.5 meters to 2 meters height. And in the pump house and tank columns, it is 3 meters. And that one which supports solar, it is 4 meters. Yeah, so in short, regarding to columns which we fabricate, uh, we have uh, 1.5 meters to 2 meters, we have 3 meters height, and we have 4 meters height of four, for, for solar columns. This is the underground columns, as you see. Then the next step will be uh, backfilling the soil, these trenches. After backfilling these trenches, then here on top, also we are going to compact this area. And then we are going to have, uh, on top of these columns, uh, we are going to have a slab. We call it ground slab, which will be covered, which is the, the, its dimension will be uh, four, four meters in both sides. So it means that from these columns, this slab will, ex ex will go out aside from these columns. Regarding to the underground columns, this one is how we fabricate from uh, ground underground beams so we we'll continue us up to 10 meters because this tower here is 10 meter tower uh, this is the two meter columns we we'll follow three meter columns and will be uh, four meter columns which is for solar supporting and to give space for uh, insulation of tank so in short for fabrication of underground columns and the others Basically, the columns are identical. They differ in length, as we have seen here. It is 25 centimeter, both sides, and they differ it is height. Thank you for listening me, Karibu Tanzania. Today we are going. All right. So, another great video by Leonard, and please, I want to say again that the dimensions that Leonard is showing and, and talking about is, is based on Tanzania design, okay? So each and every country needs to make sure that the methods are correct, but the dimensions and the types of structures are according to their design. Okay, so after we are casting concrete, we, we have the, the very critical stage of curing, very important stage. Curing, we do it for after every, every casting of concrete. The curing is a process that makes sure that after concrete is being casted, it is kept moist and wet because the concrete, when it's fresh, all the, the components are mixed with water and then casted the concrete starts a process called hydration. This is the process that gives the concrete its strength. All the crystals and the materials, the chemicals inside the cement starting to react with the water 
to create this rock, rock-like uh, material, the concrete. So the amount of water inside the concrete during the hydration process affects the final strength of the concrete, the quality of concrete, and the quality of the finishes. So curing is a process that makes sure that while the concrete is being hardened, the, the concrete is not losing a lot of water that may compromise the final strength. So what we see in the pictures is curing of the ground slab and curing for columns. So on the ground slab here, you can see uh, sand being uh, here on the, on the ground slab sand to create some kind of water ponding and the sand itself is moist. So the concrete of the ground slab is always being immersed with water and the columns are being wrapped with uh, sheets of nylon to prevent evaporation of water through the surface of the concrete. And once in a while, the, the workers take a bucket of water and pour it into the, the, on, on the concrete, on the, the elements to make sure that it's always wet. Here on the left side, we can see a tap stand. I think it's in Uganda. This picture is from Uganda of a tap stand being uh, cured in a curing process with banana leaves. So the banana leaves are sitting here to prevent evaporation of water and to protect the concrete from the sun. And this sack here, it's on the tap stand itself. And once in a while again, someone comes with a bucket of water and pour water on the, the tap stand. Let's see a quick video for curing. Today we are going to talk about uh, curing. Curing is a process of providing water to the structure or concrete structure to make sure that it is uh, wet at every stage after concreting. Uh, let's say uh, you concrete uh, after one day, to second day you should have to start curing. This curing is very important to the concrete because concrete to become hard it need a lot of water for hydration or to itself to organize to become harder. So uh, it is advised once you concrete the second day you start curing and so long that this uh, concrete need more waters so you should have to make that during the 14 days this concrete is not becoming dry you can cure by ponding as you see here we are doing you can cure by wrapping with a plastic bag this plastic bag it prevents the structure from sunlight or from wind so uh, you, you after preventing means that the structure become in a long time it is wet so in so doing the structure become more hard or it become strong as by design so here we are going to wrap all all all, all of these columns uh, to make sure it is wet during the within uh, 14 days so that in short is the importance of curing of our structure which we are uh, constructing thank you for listening in short Today we are going to talk about all right. So that's that was for curing, and we talked about the foundation, ground slab, and columns. So the next element we have on the towers are the slabs. So the slabs are the suspended slabs, of course, the, the, the floors above the ground slab. So we have a first slab, usually also uh, the roof of the pump room. We have the tank bearing slab and we have the top slab. When, when the construction is performing for the slab, it's usually uh, on, a, on a high uh, platform and the safety and the use of scaffolding is very important here. So our team and the people that doing the site supervision need to make sure 
that the contractor is uh, practicing a safe methods of work. So on the left picture, we can see an example of trying to use scaffolding and working, uh, uh, working without any working platform and also the the fixing of this uh, of this uh, scaffolding is not not so stable and not standard now those workers that working at height risk themselves from falling or uh, of, of a serious injury and on the right we can see an example for a proper uh, erection of steel scaffolding the structure of the scaffolding is sound and sturdy. They have the rails above the working platform that acts as a guardrail for the workers. They have working platforms where they can stand and safely take materials up if it's concrete, if it's other equipment. And you can also see that they use harnesses to tie themselves into the uh, working platform. So if someone is uh, falling or, or it's not very concentrated, the harness is keeping them from falling down. Let's see another video for scaffolding. Today we are going to talk about scaffolding. Scaffolding is a, a structure which is elected at the construction structure to facilitate going up of the constructing uh, building. We have several types of scaffolding. We have, you can use steel scaffolding, you can use a pole scaffolding or crane scaffolding to the structure. But here we, are, we have steel scaffolding. And why we use steel scaffolding? We use steel scaffolding. First, it is friendly to the environmental because if you use poles or trees, means that uh, you should have to go to the, to, the, to the bush to cut the trees, to cut the poles. And then after completing one structure, you are required again to go in the bush to cut. But the steel, you can use it in several times. Second, it is strong. Third, uh, you buy for once in a many, uh, many structures construction. So also, you can, you can use it to the highest level of the building. So, before starting installing the scaffold, first of all, you should have to make sure that the ground which you are going to erect, it is level, as you see here. It is uniform in levels. And secondly, while you are installing this scaffolding, you should have to give a space from the structure which you are constructing to the scaffolding, at least 50 centimeters or 0 0.5 meters from the structure to the scaffolding. This is the vertical member, as you see. These are vertical members, have this one. Options, it depends how are you connecting this vertical member with these horizontal members. And also, uh, these horizontal members and the vertical members, we have several types. This is, you can fix with your boards, as I said before. This is, it can be vertical or horizontal. But this one is horizontal because have these locks to make sure that uh, that scaffolding is well or strong and it can accommodate people to go up and down. Thank you very much for listening to me. Today we are going to talk. Okay, so we talked about the slabs and the proper safe work for the slabs. The next stage is block works or brick works. So for towers, most of our towers, the 10 meter tower and the seven meter tower, we're building the pump room. So the pump room walls are being constructed with block works or brick works. So here we can see bricks, solid bricks. In some countries we use blocks like a hollow concrete uh, blocks. They act in the same way and they are very similar. Let's see a quick video for block work. Today we are going to talk about uh, block work and reinforcing by using a flat bar. 
first of all let me start the kind of uh, blocks which we use to this uh, pump house as you see here this block is special because we use cement sand and the chippings or small aggregate i see this type of of blocks which is very strong and this is a, a flat bar which we use to fasten to the columns after three causes during construction to make sure that the blockwork will not separate with columns so this is tightened to the wall of columns and then we built a block here on top and down such that during curing or during hardening or in a long run because blocks tends to separate with uh, uh, columns and the uh, blocks so this one uh, we reinforce it that to make sure that the, the columns and the wall are not separated and you cannot uh, see uh, cracks on the side or at the joint or at the meeting between columns and the blockwork so it is very important to install this one this size is 10 centimeters and this one to here it is at least 60 centimeters so it lay within the cores of the block and then it reinforce the blockwork to make sure to make sure that the wall is well constructed and it is strong enough uh, for our, our pump house after completion the blockwork now the following stage is uh, plastering as we see here we are plastering to make sure that the whole pump house is well covered and smooth and uh, with a good appearance so after plastering what we do we use we call it sandpaper these sandpapers we use to smoothen the wall after plastering and the columns to make sure that the columns and the wall of the pump house are smooth and they are grayish in appearance so after this stage we leave it to dry uh, to harden so the wall will be seen very attractive and very smart thank you very much okay so leonard was also talking about the brick walls reinforcement and it's very important to, to check it also in the site supervision because the block works are close to the structural elements for the, to the columns and the slabs. And we use reinforcement for the block works to make sure that we reduce the appearance of cracks and we reduce the movement of the blocks relatively to the structure. All of the details are in the construction manual, of course. So, now we will make a, a short break. Loti, I think uh, it, it was so far wonderful. I want to say thank you. Um, we're going to take a short break, maybe 10, 15 minutes, just so we can have coffee. We can take a, a short break, rest, and we should all come back at quarter to three. So 15 minutes break to all of you. And let's be back in 15 minutes at a quarter to three. I think uh, we are ready. Yes, good. So let's uh, proceed. I saw there are a lot of questions and I'm really happy that you're engaging. And in the end of the presentation, we will find time to answer the questions. And let me, let me say again that what we're doing in this presentation is going on the general topics of civil engineering and some of the topics we will review them in detail in the rest of the week. Sharon, I need your help here to that. Yeah, great. Sharon, why don't we say hello to you as well? Show us your face, my dear. Yeah, Everyone, Sharon is helping please say here. shalom to Sh <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon, for your help. She's also responsible at the background for everything. Yeah, she's a hero. All right. So uh, we talked about the slabs. And again, I want to emphasize that we have one slab out of the three slabs that we have. One of the slabs uh, is a critical stage, yeah? A reminder, critical stage, we have a total three in our water tower project. It's the ground slab, the load bearing slab, or also known as the tank slab. And the third one 
is the yeah. Yeah, but I don't want to go to the old uh, type. Do you want to have it as it was? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. Great. So uh, back to the critical stages. So we, we discussed the ground slab and the load bearing slab. So this is the load bearing slab, also known as the TAPS, TAPS uh, slab. It's a very important stage to be inspected by our third party consultant because this element is carrying the, the tremendous load of the water tank. It's 10 tons, all right? So here we're seeing the casting, the steel shattering, the reinforcement fixing. So uh, the contractor is allowed to begin with casting after the third, third party consultant saw that everything is in order and approved the casting. By the way, if I didn't mention it before, the approval of the casting must be formal, okay? Uh, it, it needs to be specified in the site supervision report of the third party consultant. It's not only uh, verbal approval or something that they do face to face. This is a formal approval that needs to be documented, okay? So we need to make sure that the third party consultants give their approval and say that they uh, inspected those sites in those critical stages. All right. We have a video, two videos of slab casting. I will show the second one. Here now we are at the uh, bottom of our structure, our slab. Maybe you see here we use timber, but basically according to the Innovation Africa manual, uh, we should have all contractors, we should have to keep that we are friendly with the environmental. We have started to move from these timbers coming to our uh, steel. So uh, let me tell you the function of those uh, timbers. Uh, once you prepare your structure there and you pour your concrete, our concrete is so heavier. So it need before hardening, it need to be supported until it become itself uh, supported. If we don't put this one, the structure support after pouring the concrete will sag, will come down. So to maintain it to that position which you have designed or you have planned, you should have to put this pause. Regardless, this pause, it can be timber or it can be steel, but its basic function is to make sure that your slab remain at the position which you planned. Okay, let us move and go up see how we have installed our reinforcement uh, and how we have spaced on top. This is a pump house slab. Now let me start with a, a formwork. This we call a formwork, the structure which shape the concrete which we are going to pour. You make sure that it is well uh, prepared in size according to the design. For instance here, we have 2.8 times 2.8 meters, this size of our pump house. We have this uh, formwork and this formwork we prefer having with a smooth face. Once you remove this one, you find your, you find your slab is smooth in appearance. Previous there, I showed you that we prepare this beam's reinforcement. So once you come here, you just lay the structure. And our structure, we call it monolithic structure because that uh, we do not differentiate a slab and the beams. So the beams is within the slab. The next step is to put a spacer. You see, these spacers is important to put a side and bottom of the slab because this spacer uh, maintain the size, the specimen from the wall to the reinforcement. So once this reinforcement become uh, exposed to the surface, it means that it, it, it can become rusted. So once it become rusted, it means that you weaken your structure, as well as we put at the bottom of the slab. 
Also, we put it to make sure that to maintain the spacer according to the design. Also, we have uh, uh, steel spacers or chair. This also helps to make sure that the spacing according to the design are maintained while or during casting. So we put this to separate a uh, down, down floor and top floor reinforcement. As you see here, it is well fixed such that even during working cannot be uh, dismantled. Also, this is a starter. This is a starter. We make sure that at the start we live there to maintain a continuity of concrete of columns. It means that those uh, reinforcements which you already prepared for continuity of your structure. You can see now we are finalizing after uh, pouring concrete and making sure that compacting properly by using this uh, vibrating machine poker to make sure that we release air pores in the concrete and to let this concrete uh, be dense or well compacted such that without any air inside. We have completed casting our pump house slab and uh, from tomorrow we will start a uh, curing. So we are going to pond water here to make that there's enough water and that our slab will harden uh, gradually and become uh, good with the strength as we designed. Thank you for listening. See you next step. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Leonard, for the this video. So you saw that at the beginning of the video, he was mentioning the, the props, the timber props. Uh, so these, these elements are actually used to hold the foam works until the concrete is hardened and can carry itself. And we are gradually moving to use steel, steel props. And also I uh, was talking about an important thing that is the spacers. So the spacers and the chairs are all uh, methods to make sure that the reinforcement is fixed properly and the space between the reinforcement and the surface of the concrete is according to the design. I'm not going into details uh, about the reinforcement because as we said, we are keeping it general, but our civil engineers will have to inspect uh, these stages thoroughly to make sure that the reinforcement is fixed properly, the use of spacers, the overlap, the, the length of the starter columns that sticks out from the slab casting, all of these uh, issues will be attended in our next lectures. So after, after the construction of the bearing slab and the third columns, the last slab is the top slab with the mounting structure. So uh, this stage is, is mentioned because the third slab or the top slab is a little bit different from the rest because we are doing, we are um, uh, preparing this aperture, this opening in the middle of the slab to be able to access the solar panels for maintenance later on. So any maintenance works, or technicians, electricians will be able to pass through this aperture to reach the solar panels or uh, also to be able to treat or make maintenance works for the tank slab, the, the, sorry, the, the water tank just uh, beneath the aperture. And other than this aperture, we have another important thing in the top slab. So in the cast of this slab, other than the regular reinforcement steel, you can see that we're installing anchors. So at the corners, you can see these anchors sticking out. So those anchors are the preparation for the mounting structure of the solar panels. So the solar panels are installed and sitting on a steel frames, steel structure that holds them together. 
this steel structure called the mounting structure is connected to the concrete, to the tower. And the way of connection is through those anchors. Those anchors are embedded into the concrete with a specified length and a specified shapes for those anchors to be embedded into the casting of the concrete. And of course, all of the details are found in the drawings and in the construction manual. So the top slab is special due to the openings and the anchors and preparation for the mounting structure. Let's see uh, a video for the last slab. Now we are going to talk about the, the last slab of the structure. As we have seen before, we have a ground slab, we have pump house slab, we have a tank slab, and now we have the last slab, we call it a, a solar slab. To reach this solar slab, the column should be four meters apart for the purpose of accessing maintenance or services. So as you see here, this slab, uh, have, we have provided an aperture or manhole such that will be easier to access to the solar, also to access to the tank if we are doing anything for the tank, installing fittings, because between the tank and this slab, there is a difference of one meter. So this will uh, facilitate the man who will make a service for solar and tank easier. And the solar panels, which will be uh, direct to this aperture, will be fixed, will not be welded, will be fixed with bolts, such that uh, it comes sometimes in a long run, the solar becomes with dust on top. So we need to clean that cells, that solar panels, to restore it is efficient. So uh, the, the serviceman or the attendant should have to pass through this aperture, tend to the solar, open that solar, and he will be above the solar, then it will be easier to him to clean that solar on top, such that to restore it is efficient. So uh, the speciality or the difference of this slab is the provision of this manhole. Now here we are preparing to pour our concrete, which will be the uh, last stage of our slab. Thank you for listening. Warmly welcome. So another great video by Leonard, and he mentioned the aperture. Now and we are going to talk. As about we said before, the special thing about the top slab is the aperture and the anchors preparation for the mounting structure. So after the tower the, is completed, the the concrete works are completed. The the another construction stage is the elevation elevating the tank, the water tank, and installing the water tank. So in those pictures, we can see a proper way of hoisting or elevating the water tank and a safe work and safe practices of doing it. You can see the workers are using uh, harnesses to, to locate the tank. And more details about the locations of the tank I think it will be provided by the water department because the orientation of the tank uh, is also important to make sure that the openings for the pipe works are directing the correct uh, way. But in the civil work uh, aspect, I want to mention that the, the, the importance of the timing of the tank installation because as we said earlier, the concrete is going through a hardening process and it takes, it takes 28 days for the concrete to reach the full design strength. From the day that the concrete is casted, it takes 28 days to reach the full strength. But the concrete is gaining strength as it's getting older. So in the age of seven days and in the age of 14 days, the concrete is developing strength. So a lot of times the tower is completed uh, even before 
all of the structural elements reach their full strength. And sometimes the tank is being elevated and being installed even before uh, the last slabs and the columns reach the age of 28 days. So it's very important to say that an empty tank can be installed in this stage because the concrete is at least seven days old and it has sufficient uh, strength to hold an empty tank. But start using the tank and fill it, in, fill, fill it up with water, which means the tower needs to start carrying the full loads, the full design loads is allowed only after the age of 28 days. And of course, after the approval of the structure by the third party consultant. So after installing the tank, uh, the last stage is uh, installing the solar panels and installing the mounting structure for the solar panels. So in general here, we see how uh, these metal frames look like. This picture was taken in Cameroon. And it's important to mention that each country have their own specific design for the mounting structure due to the geographical location of the country. So the solar panels have different orient orientation uh, to fully uh, use the, the, the sun power. So the angles might be a little bit different and the amount of solar panels can be changed. So the design of each country has its own mounting structure. This is an example from Cameroon. We can see uh, how they used steel profiles welded together to create the steel frames and how the structure is anchored to the concrete of the tower. So this is a very important uh, uh, structure as well. And the third party consultant is checking it. We need to make sure that he's checking this structure. And our civil engineers also need to make sure that the mounting structure is constructed according to the design because uh, this structure is holding the solar panels and the solar panels are exposed to winds and to the weather. And we need to make sure that they are properly fixed to the tower. So up until now, we were talking about the tower, all the stages of the tower. We have uh, the auxiliary structures that we're going to review quickly. So we have the tap stands, the water points. So the construction of the tap stands is starting with location, locating the, the tap. Each tap has its own location according to the water design, to the epanet. So when our civil engineers or other representative of Innovation Africa doing site supervision, when we supervise a water, uh, a water point or a tap stand, we need to ask ourselves, what's the number of that tap stand I'm seeing? Is it tap stand number four? Is it tap stand number two? And according to the identity of the tap stand, they need to make sure that it's on the right location according to the design. Once we are sure that the tap stand is in the right location, we can see the construction uh, methods of the tap. So um, we, we have the foundation. So we, we make some excavations because the tap stands are not just sitting at the top level of the ground. They have some depth into the ground to give them stability. And then they are doing the shuttering works, the foam works, fixing of reinforcement, and of course, casting of concrete. So let's see video of water point or tap stand by Leonard. Today we're going to see how to set for water tap or water point construction. The simple way of starting setting for water point is you prepare the formwork as indicated in the construction manual. 
So after setting this one, once you come here to the site where you expect to construct the water point, you just uh, clear the site as you see here. You should have to make sure that your site is clean and then you put down this formwork which you have already set it. After putting this one, you take a measurement according to the size of a domestic water point. Then you mark. Those points which is are marking is, is going to be excavated uh, to prepare as a foundation for starting constructing this uh, water tap point. So uh, after setting marking these points, then you are going to remove this one. So long we have marked it down, very simple, then you start excavating. Uh, you can excavate according to the depth which are, is required for the tape construction. For instance here, our tape foundation, you should have to go down uh, 30 centimeters down and on top you leave on top 20 centimeters, such that 10 centimeters will be for the gutters and 10 is laid, lazing as a platform from ground level to the level where the water point will be as seen for letting the water to flow out smoothly. The next step we will see how we cast the concrete after excavation, uh, placing reinforcement and uh, putting the tapes and then we will see. The exercise of setting out, excavating and uh, blinding has completed. So this stage now is a stage of casting the uh, water point. As you have seen here, we put our blinding layer. You see this? This is a blinding layer. And then we put reinforcement, these six millimeter uh, bars. And then we put a tap, as I said that, before that the tap will depend where the line will come from. For instance, here, our tap, the line will come to the, from the tower. The tower is there, will come here. So we twisted that one. To, to make that we are going to connect here. And here is the reinforcement to support, to support our stand. Uh, as, uh, as, as according to design, our tap is a reinforced tap, reinforced concrete tap. So you see here, you can see the formwork. We have three types. This one for outside, this one for inside, and this one to shape the gutters, which will uh, smoothly leave water from the tap outward and here and here this is also a gutter around the whole tap will give the shape of gutters around it and this will be a platform on this platform also we're going to construct a bucket seat on top that that area after casting it so and at the end of this side we are going to excavate soak away soak away pit will be here with a diameter of one meters so after casting so to this stage, as you see, we have a concrete mixer, which will be, be mixing the concrete. We have cement, sand. Everything is here with water. Such once you start, you have prepared the things like that. It is easier to construct a tape in a smooth way. After casting the concrete between, there is a formwork, metal formwork. You see here, this will be, this one will be this one. We join at the center to produce uh, a stand at the middle, yeah, like that one. So this will be that side, yeah. So at that side, it will be easier also to pour a concrete and to get a shape of a nice water point or water stand or water kiosk. Thank you for listening to this stage. The water tap after finishing this level of building the tap, then we have a, a stage of soccer wave. A soak away a pit. This pit down at the bottom we fill with uh, stones. On top we cover with a... Uh... Okay, let me stop in the stage of the soak away pit because we have a different video for soak away pit. So we saw uh, how they're doing, how they're performing the construction of the tap stand. And I must say that there are uh, mainly two ways to do the casting. Uh, one way is to cast everything in one stage to do the bottom and the pillar of the taps together. 
some places or in some instances, the tap stand is being casted in two stages. First of all, the lower part with the gutters and the channels, and only afterwards casting the, the pillar of the taps. So uh, every tap stand should have a, a manhole. The manhole is a valve manhole. What we're seeing here in the picture is um, the, the design of the, of the valve manholes that we had up until now. And we updated the design of the manhole to be, to be designed in a way that the cover will be overlapping the edges of the, of the manhole. So we will prevent as much as possible uh, water from rains or groundwater from getting into the valve manhole. Okay, so another element of a tap stand is the soak pit or soak away pit. The, the aim or the purpose of the soak away pit is to, to take the excess water from the tap stand and release them slowly back into the ground without making any water ponding in the surroundings of the tap stand because this, you can imagine that this tap stand is also in a water environment when people are using it, and we don't want to have uh, ponding water around it to prevent uh, any sanitary issues. So the soak pit is at the end of the drainage channel. The water are getting into the soak pit. The soak pit, once it's constructed, it's covered, it is covered and then the water can seep away back into the ground. Um, another important thing, and it's updated in, in the drawings and the design of tap stands for all countries, is the metal screen here. You can see it here. Uh, in the end of the, the channel, the drainage channel, we prescribe to perform and to install this metal screen. This is a very simple uh, element, but it's very important because with time and due to the environment of our villages, a lot of debris may uh, go into the soak pit and then slowly clog it and slowly uh, uh, reduce the efficiency of water flowing. So we have this metal screen to prevent leaves and, and debris to go in. And of course the community needs to be aware that once in a while they need to clean this area to maintain the drainage channels of this of the tap stand. We are competing to construct a water tap. The water tap after finishing this level of building the tap then we have a a stage of soak away, a soak away a pit. This pit down at the bottom we fill with uh, stones. On top we cover with uh, a gravel. So this lock and the gravel help to facilitate water to soak away in the ground such that the water which will be washed here will be entering inside and then it will be easier soaked away in the ground. Also this step uh, after this one stage, also we are going to level along this tab and then we are going to put gravel around the tab to allow while somebody is, is fetching water here not to take uh, uh, mud in the tab. So in short, for soak away and the completed tab and what we are going to cover around it with the gravel uh, is as here. So later on you are going to see how the completed uh, tab with the soak away and the Allowed with the gravels, it look alike. Uh, here the completed tap. What is remaining here is just to put a cox here after flushing the system to make sure that the system is clean. Then after flushing, then we fix it two taps. And you see along the, the tap, completed tap, we have well arranged with this gravel along the tap. And at the end there, as you see before that, this is the soak away, the soak away pit. It is well arranged 
we start with stones and we finish with these uh, gravels on top, as you see here. So, any washing water, which will be flow, which will be here. So, with this, uh, so I wanted to stop here, just to, to mention that uh, here the soak away pit is hidden underneath the gravel, but be aware that in our updated designs, the soak, soak away pit, they have a, a concrete cover. Okay, and also we saw here in the excavation of the soak pit, here we saw that they are just putting in the stones, but please note that now we are also using the geotextile membrane, and we will explain further about this, uh, the details of design in the in-depth uh, CV lectures. So another auxiliary structure that we have is the cattle trough. The cattle trough is being constructed usually in the outskirts of the village, uh, in, a, in, a in a decent uh, distance from the water source. The cattle, the cattle trough is constructed from a reinforced concrete slab and a lot of block works to create these uh, uh, voids to hold the water for, for the cattle. So we have the block works and the wall in the middle needs to have these openings in the bottom to enable the water to be connected from both chambers. And uh, usually we have the valve manholes uh, installed or constructed uh, right on the cattle trough. But in some countries, for example, in Cameroon, the valve manhole is disconnected from the cattle trough and it's being located closer to the village because the community wants to have uh, control over the flowing of the water closer to their village. But basically, this is the standard design for the cattle trough. Another construction stage that I will not go into detail because this is also an overlapping topic with the water department, but after all the, the structures are being constructed, the water tower, the tap stands, maybe the cattle trough, all of them need to be connected with the pipes. So the trenching works and the pipeline works uh, are being carried uh, and done with the community. And in the site supervision, our team needs to make sure that the dimensions of the trenchings are correct, the diameter of the pipes are correct, the diameters of the pipe are very important, they must comply with the EPANE design. And we need to understand that in most projects we have kilometers of pipe works, if it's three and a half kilometers or more of pipe works. And once the, the pipes are being laid in the trenches and being covered, it is very hard for our team to understand and to make sure that the right diameters were, were used. And of course, we had some cases from, from the field that we had the problems with the water pressure in the taps. So we made sure that the taps are in the right location and they were. And the second thing we had to check is if the pipes to the tap stands are according to the design, according to the diameter specified in the eponet. So we had to excavate together with the contractor and uncover the pipes to see that the diameter was wrong. So now we need to make sure that before they cover the trench, we need to make sure that the pipes, the path is correct and the diameter is according to the design. And I'm sure that the water department will explain further in their lecture. Welcome back today. We are going to discuss about trenching for pipeline. Yeah, first of all, uh, before starting trenching, 
we meet with villagers, we sit together and explain the route of pipe and where they are going to, to dig. After sitting together and discussing and coming to the agreement, then what we do, we come to the site, we straight the lines to make sure that this trench which is going to be dug will be straight. Uh, in assistance with those trainees, then the villagers, they divide them, themselves according to the number and the routes where the trenches is going to the taps. So as you see here, this is a part of uh, villagers who their part is to dig this area. So, so long we have trained two peoples for uh, supervising the trench digging, then they supervise and making sure that the trench is straight and is according to the specification of one meter deep. So in short, uh, is how we conduct this trench digging day to day to this project. Thank you very much. Work. Okay, so we are uh, about to about to finish. So the last of the construction stages is the completion and snags. This stage is the last stage when all the elements are constructed. And this stage is also considered as a critical stage. So we had three critical stage for the third party consultant, the ground slab and the tank slab. And the last one is this one, the completion and snags. So in this stage, the third party consultants come to the site and make a site supervision together with our team and creating a snag list. The snag list need to include the description of, of snags of defects found in the project. Of course, photo and the description of the, of the snag and the date of the visit. Why it's so important to document all of those? Because we need to follow up the rectification and the fixing of this snag list. So when the contractor is uh, done with the project, he has a liability period where um, he needs to fix any snags or defects that we found in the project. So we're doing this process on the completion. Now, the snag list uh, may have all kinds of different type of, types of snags. And here I mentioned a few of them as an example, but as you know, it can be a lot of things regarding the concrete works, maybe the water works, the pressure of the taps, maybe it's the, the, uh, the light, lighting um, or the doors or the locks from small things to bigger things. But it's very important to do this stage together with the third party consultant. So our team, and the consultant build this uh, list together, okay? They need to have the same list and then our team can follow up with the contractor to fix those snags to have a perfect uh, project. So the snag list is part of the completion and another a very important part of the completion is the concrete tests. So we mentioned that the concrete after being casted develops its strength during uh, over time. So for every batching of concrete and every cast casting that the consult that the contractor is doing on site, they need to take samples of concrete cubes, samples of cube to test the concrete strength in two occasions. First, age of seven days and last the age of 28 days. On those tests, we have the results of the strength of the concrete and then we can make sure that the concrete is good and it's according to the design and then we will have a stable and sturdy structure. So here on this slide, we can see two types of testing the concrete strength that we use in IA. So one way is to use the Schmidt hammer. Schmidt hammer is basically a standard tool with a spring in it. And according to the rebound of the spring, 
against the, the, the hardened concrete, we can evaluate the, the strength of the concrete. So this is a non-destructive method because you, you are not crushing anything. You're just testing the concrete when it's done. Another, another test is crash tests. You take the samples of the concrete cubes, take it to a laboratory and crush the cubes with a special, uh, uh, with a special uh, jack. And then you can define the strength of the concrete. So the third party consultant must receive the results of the concrete tests. What are the results? What are the values? So we said the concrete test should be performed in two occasions, the age of seven days of the concrete and the age of 28 days. Our concrete is designed to be type C25 over 30, according to the British standard. This is a 30 megapascals concrete, okay? So the minimum strength needs to be according to those values. So the average of the samples in the age of seven days need to be at least 23 megapascals. And the average of the samples in the age of 28 days need to be at least 33 megapascals. Also important is to, to see and check if single specimen is not lower than 19 megapascals in the age of seven days and 27 megapascals in the age of 28 days, because we need to make sure that we don't have specific parts in the concrete that are extremely weak. So we need to pay attention for the overall average and the minimum strength of a single specimen. So these results are going to the third party consultant and if they are satisfying and the concrete is found strong enough according to the design, uh, the, the consultant is providing the completion certificate, okay? So the completion certificate is produced by the third party consultant where he's basically saying that the structures were constructed according to the standards and they are safe and uh, everything is okay. So he will provide the completion certificate after all the snags are rectified and fixed and the concrete strength tests are satisfying. This is an example of a, of a completion certificate from Uganda, from Ivan. Okay, our consultants are structural engineers and by law, they have a legal responsibility to stamp and improve the, the completed structures to say that they are safe and they are built according to the standards. Thank you very much. We are done and thanks for listening. So now Sharon will help me to go through some of the questions. Excellent job, Mati. Truly wonderful, Moti, wonderful job. I also want uh, everyone to say hello, hello to Shalom Mo. Shalom, are you with us? Please unmute yourself. <laughs> one, one moment, yes. I'm now unmute. I'm now unmute. And you yeah. Shalom, good to see you. As all of you know, Shalom is our senior civil engineer. He has been with us for over one year and he has helped a lot in um, redoing our uh, design. Uh, so now both of them, both uh, Shalom and uh, Moti, are going to answer uh, your questions. Um, Moti, can you read the questions of the team? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Sorry if I'm not answering all of them. Okay, so I will pick the ones that I see. Uh, 
Okay, so Roger's asking the poles which are meant to support the slabs, must they be steel or they can be wood type? So uh, you, you're talking about the props. So the scaffolding need to be steel and the props, we are going slowly and gradually to improve the, the props uh, of the contractors to be steel. Of course, some of them are still using wood and it, this is okay as long as there are new contractors and we are starting to work with them, but overall we expect them to, uh, as they go uh, working with us more and more to improve their equipment and work with steel props. I hope that helps. Um, Do you want us to help you? Yeah, I'm looking for... Okay, so regarding the Smith hammers, as I mentioned, we have bought many of them and we have them in Israel. We're supposed to bring them with us to Tanzania to give uh, to each one of you at least one or two Smith hammers. So hopefully in the next uh, few weeks, once we travel again, we're going to bring it to you for you to have and therefore you can... Um, you can use them in order to uh, test the strength of the concrete. Okay, so Gabby, Gabby is asking, in addition to the three stages mentioned, um, if we can confirm a critical stage of installing the pump at the right depth. So I believe that Gabby is uh, referring to installation of, of pump in the well in the part of the well development. Uh, yes, I think it's a critical stage and this is part of the uh, hydrogeology department, okay? So now we discussed only critical stages in the construction. Uh, correct, That's and Shai gonna be talking a lot about the um, supervision done by the water engineer. And also we're gonna have a one hour session about the pump selection and where to install the pump. So that's also going to be done in the next few days. So here, as Moti mentioned, we're only talking about the responsibilities of the civil engineers and the next session by Shai, we're going to talk about the water engineers. Yeah, so William from Uganda, he's asking about 28 days of concrete maturity before filling the tank with water. Does it mean that the consultant will have to visit the site before allow allowing water into the tank or we can confirm this as IA team after 28 days? So that's a good question. And the answer is the water should be filled in the tank only after third party consultant approval because when the tank is full, it weighs 10 tons and we need the consultant approval for the structure before we utilize the full loads on the structure. Um, maybe we have room for another question. I see the Tanzania team is asking about the 400 liter concrete mixture. Okay, yeah, the mixer is, the, the concrete mixer that we require is 400 liter, and they are asking if it's okay to use 350 liter. So the requirement that we have for, of, of the concrete mixture is that we want to make sure that our concrete elements can be casted in one, uh, one act of concrete batching, okay? If we have a slab or if we have uh, uh, four columns, we need a, a, a concrete mixer that is big enough to, to provide us concrete for one continuous cast. If you use smaller mixers, you will have to stop the casting, make another batch and then casting again. And then you will have this gap uh, of, of non-continuous casting and we don't want that to happen. Uh, engineer Wangisa from Uganda is asking 
instead of taking sample of seven days, we have taken samples in 14 days or 28 days. Is it okay? So uh, I know that it depends on the type of the structure and the standards of the, of, of the country. A lot of people test concrete in different ages, but we want to test the concrete in the age of seven days and 28 days for a few reasons. First of all, we cannot perform a lot of testing because we, our, our projects are fast-tracked projects. They are done in 60 days. So we test the seven days to make sure to have a first indication for the quality of the concrete. Because we know that in the age of seven days, we expect to have about 70%, about 70% of the, of the full strength of the concrete. So in the age of seven days, we can already know and, and have an indication if the concrete is okay. The second test in the age of 28 days is only to finally approve the concrete strength. There is one question from Ayan Moti. For clarification, we sh should we hold on filling the tank with water for 28 days? Yes. Okay, that was easy. Um, along that lines with Mayan's questions, there was a number of questions that she raised about the tap stands and the soak pits. So one of the questions uh, Mayan mentioned was that some of the communities like to plant vegetables where the soak pit runoff water flows. Is there an alternative design we can consider where this is relevant? Yeah, so what's what happening with the excess of water is uh, first of all needs to be a, a decision from IA and then we can uh, discuss the alternatives for now. The only alternative that we have for the top stand is soak away pit because we want to prevent the ponding of water. I know that in some cases they they somehow I saw I saw on field that somehow they use their water for agriculture, but formally uh, our design is based on soak away pits to prevent any ponding of water close to the top stand. I'm going back up to kind of the, the beginning. I know you covered manhole covers, but Charles from Uganda asked um, about the concrete manhole covers that have to be, if they can be replaced with metallic ones as there's difficulty opening to do cleaning and servicing. If you can speak on that. Yeah, so um, I know that we can use better types of concrete covers for the manholes or, or metallic type but uh, we also have costs consideration and simplicity. So basically we need to follow the design for the concrete cover. But if we have any special case of a specific project, we can discuss it uh, specifically for the project. Yeah. I see a, a very good question by Josian. So Josian from Cameroon, she's a civil engineer and she's asking, what happens when we notice a major defects on concrete element? What are the extreme cases where you can proceed to suspension of works? And what is the administrati administrative procedure to adopt? Shalom, if you want to answer or... Yeah. Like. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Josian. I just want to clear uh, to, to clear back the two questions about the, the filling of the water tank. I, I, we must uh, understand that it's not 28 days from the completion of the whole tower. It's 28 days from the, from the date of casting the, the tank slab. So there is some work done on the, con on the project also after casting the, the the tank slab. So the, the timeline is 28 days from the casting the, the uh, tank slab. And now for major, um, major um, uh, uh, problems in the concrete structure, uh, um, 
encountered by our uh, consult by our supervisors the the major uh, problems that they can uh, see on site for a concrete structure is the cracks so if uh, uh, if uh, a structure uh, the columns or the slab they can see some major cracks not uh, not uh, 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 aesthetic hydration cracks, cracks. yeah uh, not a uh, not hydration cracks they're very thin less than one millimeter and um, they have to uh, stop the work and send the pictures and consult with uh, with the engineers in in the head office and then we can evaluate uh, uh, evaluate uh, the problem and to see what can be done uh, with this project in some cases uh, uh, the uh, the remedy is to uh, the uh, the before uh, before loading the water in the in the in the tank we will have to strengthen the elements with some steel structure with steel supports or any other methods of strengthening the concrete structure but what exactly we're going to do it can be it is evaluated from one case to another case but uh, but of course uh, this is a major thing that has to be quickly brought forward to the engineering and taking and taking the uh, the advice of the exact uh, uh, procedures that we have to do with this concrete structure thank you okay last question um from, I think it's team South Africa. In terms of spacers, do we use the brick as seen on the video or it must be a, uh, specially designed spacers to ensure accurate space is maintained? The main question is this, how does anyone know accurately that all the spacers have the same uh, same dimensions okay let me let me answer this so yes there are uh, specified uh, spacers on the market as you saw on the pictures some spacers are um, used for columns some spacers are used for slabs but in our projects uh, we use all kinds of spacers and the role of the civil engineer while uh, supervising the site to check that the spacers are adequate. It means that they are made of good materials if it's these little bricks and to make sure that the, the, the cover, the, the dimension of the spacer is correct. Okay. Okay. So oh, oh, all done, all done. Agar, what was your question, please? The last one from Gabby. Yeah, so Gabby is asking if we can fill the tank even just a little bit when construction is over, because from what we understand, we need to push commissioning now because we cannot fill the tank. Is that please clarify if we can fill the tank and do commissioning before 28 days are over or we cannot fill even a little bit of water? Uh, a little a, surely, a little a little bit is a problematic definition like halfway uh, one third one fourth can we get some sort of range i um uh, as far as uh, as far as i can phantom uh if you fill it one third of the of the quantity uh you can you can uh, we can take this risk there is no problem Okay, so we got the, the answer one third of so meaning uh, 3000 liters uh, could be yes. could be uh, okay. I see last last question from Chisomo. It's a good okay. one about the grounding bar. So Chisomo is asking, are we going to coat the, the foundation grounding bar with zinc or any suitable material as per your communication before? Okay, so on the details of the earthing bar of, uh, of each country, we specify the type of the bar and it's generally, it's galvanized iron. 
Only in Malawi, they had a shortage in this type of uh, galvanized iron. And we allowed them to, to make a, a zinc, zinc coating, yeah, with the paint of zinc coating. So in general, the, the, the answer is stick to the design. And if you have any special cases due to lack of specific item, please communicate it uh, to be able to find an alternative. Okay, everyone, um, I think that's it. It was a, a wonderful session, really, Moti, thank you very much. Moti and Shalom, of course. Shalom, although he hasn't uh, spoken a lot and he let uh, Moti to speak, Shalom, of course, has done a lot uh, of the work beforehand in making sure that the drawings are in place and everything is, uh, is our standard. So thank you, Shalom, thank you, Moti. And, um, we are on time, which is absolutely wonderful. Let us take 15 minutes break. And then please come back with a lot of coffee and Coca-Cola and chocolate and whatever you need, because the next session most likely will be the most important session that we are going to have this, uh, this week. And we're going to hear from Shai, our water engineer in, in Israel. And she's going to tell us everything that we need to know about water design, epinet, pipes, pumps. Very, very important. We spent a lot of time in preparing uh, the next PowerPoint. So once again, go ahead, get some fresh hair, get some coffee, come back. I want to see you hap and uh, ready to listen and to learn. And Shai, she's there waiting for you. Let's give us 15 minutes. We're gonna start at, uh, you know what? Let's give you a bit more. We're gonna start at four and 10 minutes, four and 10 minutes. Yeah, 